Good morning, everybody. Um, good afternoon, rather. Welcome back to uh, the first sporting lunchtime lecture of the season. I can see most people didn't get the uh, didn't get a prompt. Perhaps they said about uh, sulking about Mark Hughes being staffed, or who knew you managed Mark being whatever. Anyways, uh, it's great to welcome Simon to uh, the Report Cafe. It's kind of one of these academic dominoes um, where we've been passed from person to person. And Pete Watson, who did the talk about Colombian football, said you need to get Simon involved. With that. And we exchanged emails, and Simon popped up with the idea that he really likes vinyl uh, craft deals and football. So I said, welcome to your spiritual hook. <laughs> Uh, well, football. We can't. Well, we can't. We can't guarantee the football. We can guarantee the standard of um, of accommodation and drink and and, and records, but not the football. Anyway, we've, without further ado, I'll pass to Sam and he'll introduce himself. Well, thank you very much. Great, great pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for providing time in your Saturday morning and uh, your pre-match routine, which looks a little different from mine. Team, which looks a little different from mine. And. Um, this is not the first time I've been to Bradford. It is the first time I've been to the Record Cafe and the first time I've had the chance to speak in Bradford. So I did want to just take a moment um, because the first awareness I had of Bradford would have been one that I suspect many of you may have shared much more viscerally than I did. And that was, of course, what happened on the 11th of May, 1975. And as a 10-year-old, it made a significant impression in what I understood football to be. So paying my due respects to those who lost their lives those that, that day. If I may then respectfully uh, change the subject, and I'm going to uh, provide a little bit of a narrative to a journey of mine, um, looking at the world of sport diplomacy, games within games. So this is an opportunity for me to share a quote that I'm sure many of you have seen before. Um, Everything, almost all that I should mo uh, know most surely about morality and obligations I owe to football. Albert Camus, French philosopher, and by no uh, second guessing, quite a good goalkeeper, um, shared this motif that many of us would have heard before. And what it does is it tells us a little bit about how football shapes the world, and certainly shapes our world, I dare say, by being here today. This example, though, is as much about sport diplomacy as it is about French philosophy. Uh, the latter I know more about than the former. And you will recognise, I'm sure, the images on the wall. Alexander Seprin, head of UEFA. LFC, Liverpool football fans. Uh, Prince William, then the third in line, now second in line, our future king, head of state and uh, president of the Football Association, noting that it is just the Football Association, the country in which we live doesn't have the moniker of its nation in front of it. Uh, some Manchester United fans, our erstwhile but two prime ministers, um, Mr Johnson, the populist as ever, and uh, Valencia uh, players welcoming Lionel Messi onto the pitch. Um, my Spanish is not good, um, but their T-shirts suggest that football is for the fans, not necessarily for the money. Now, the significance of this image, uh, or this collage of images, is the range of different actors we have involved. So we have a couple of football clubs who really don't have a lot in common, don't necessarily like talking to each other, but within hours of the announcement of the European Super League, were in league together. We have the head of the UEFA football uh, organisation, the governing body of European football, which was immediately challenged by the European Super League. We have the king uh, to be um, as head of a national football association and a prime minister who is incredibly populist and would grab onto anything that he thought would help his cause. So in this instance, you have a lot of different things coming together and they are not the same thing. They are not all football clubs, they are not all football players, they are not all governments. It is this mixing up um, of different actors that signifies the sort of study of sport diplomacy and why it's hopefully, over the course of the next 40 minutes, something interesting for us to talk about. 
I'm very happy to be interrupted. Any questions, any queries, anything that's not clear as we go along, so please feel free to do that. This is going to be a sort of let motif though of what I speak about, the range of different actors. So, you know, this, the social environment in which this footballing kind of things work, this is how it matters. But also I want to be utterly clear that this is about money. There's a lot of money involved. The European Super League is one sort of manifestation of that money, but there's money involved in this and we shouldn't be shy, uh, negligent in not saying it. The clubs involved in the European Super League were you know, uh, significantly financially invested with it. Many of you may have come across Swiss Ramble very good uh, football accountant, and um, I would recommend following his, I uh, believe it's his, insight into uh, what football finance looks like. And it's no coincidence actually that the outcome of the European Super League is not necessarily the European Super League as that was conceived in May 2021, but actually the challenge and the change to UEFA's Champions League, its premium product, what it tells us is the best football competition in the world. Oh. Because from next year, the European, uh, the European Champions League will look a little bit like what the European Super League proposed. And this compromise from something that was utterly unfathomable to where it is now is very much akin to the process of diplomacy. Because you make deals with your enemies, ultimately. Your friends too, but sometimes your enemies. And we can speak to many different examples of how sport diplomacy come together. And in some senses, there's a relationship with sport politics, sport society, sport and history. But I would point to you know the invasion of Ukraine by Vladimir Putin and Russia as a very clear example. Sport was one of the first responders to that crisis, an ongoing crisis. A crisis in which sport was put at the forefront of this now evolving back. In all likelihood, and you know, not speculating too wildly to say that Russian and Belarusian athletes will take part in the 2024 Olympics. Under some guys, not necessarily as uh, the same equivalent status that their colleagues from other countries will, but they will be competing, I suggest. Another way of expressing the point about a range of different actors. And it's not that I have particular affiliation, half on it, to uh, Conservative Prime Ministers. But this rather illustrates that their heads do pop up in various places as a means of capturing both the diplomatic relations that they want to have and the sporting world in which gives it a platform. So here you see President Xi of China, Sergio Aguero and Another once removed Prime Minister, David Cameron, squeezing his head in that side in a selfie that Aguero shared with his 9 million Twitter followers and his Instagram followers, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in 2015. A little while ago now, it's got a little vintage. But what this was signifying was David Cameron's outreach to China. However problematic that may have been, he invited President Xi, he took him to the pub in Oxford where he, you know, in his constituency, he took him to the Northern Powerhouse, which we may come back to, um, and suggested that football was a key part of you know, British heritage. President Xi suggested that football was a key part of Chinese heritage and that the game could be traced back within China many, many centuries, long before um, our friends in Sheffield founded the football club. So this again illustrates all those different actors. You've got an individual player, agents, multinational corporations, different financial arrangements. You know, Manchester City, as we know, is owned by the Abu Dhabi City Football Group, but it has Chinese overseas investment. So rather like our friends in Newcastle now, who have quite a lot of Saudi investment, China have invested in Manchester City through Abu Dhabi. Whether you're a season ticket holder at the Etihad and you care, perhaps not, because you're more worried about how many goals Haaland's going to score on a Saturday afternoon. But the makeup of that particular football club not uniquely, and not because they're not my favourite, um, demonstrates that they have a number of those different stakeholders that's shaping the world of 
their football club, but also the diplomatic transactions that go on behind. And much of what goes on in diplomacy is done behind closed doors. So these are the kind of business transactions, which is why I emphasize the money at the outset, the money matters to people like Abu Dhabi, who have quite a lot of it already, but they want some of the Chinese investment, Poss possibly not really for the financial benefit, but because it's a diplomatic relationship. And it's also worth bearing in mind that Manchester City were founded by uh, cloth workers in the Lancashire mills, as many football clubs uh, were in, in the north of England. And particularly, I think it's worth emphasising in the Manchester base, lots of clubs in Lancashire, not, not so much in Yorkshire, benefit from the follow up uh, outputs of transnational slavery during this that period. So much of and it's not unique to the Manchester City, but that product is part of that colonial tale also. And whilst we don't have a lot of indigenous um, faces on these slides, that's another thing that we should be conscious of. But you do have my mugging space there. And this is a little bit of the sort of autobiography and perhaps some of the context to sport, understanding sport diplomacy as we stand here today in 2023. I would not have been having this conversation with anyone in 2012. And that's not to be too self-aggrandizing, but because in 2012, we were still very much grappling with understanding what these two words that I and a couple of other gentlemen, uh, Stuart Murray, who's now uh, based down in Australia on the Gold Coast, and Jeff Pigman were talking about in a couple of bar conversations at various academic conferences. People who understood and to a degree understood, studied, diplomacy, but also really appreciated how sport interacted with it. And London 2012 was a sort of game changer because I ended up working not with any particular volition and not for a great deal of money, I must say, uh, for local, um, not as an extra in 2012, although that would have been fun, um, but uh, in the International Relations Department. And the International Relations Department of LOCOP was not like the International Relations Departments of universities that I've been working to for working in for you know, 15 years by then. And what it told me was that there was a whole world of sporting international relations that were not being covered, not being addressed, not being talked to. And the people in those offices could do better. There was lots of opportunity for them to understand the diplomatic processes, not the high level stuff necessarily, that would have enabled them to do their job better. So the germ of a story started there. And again, apologies to any half decent photographers in the room. Uh, these are taken by yours truly mm -hmm. um, during the job that I undertook. Uh, well, I didn't always have to have um, that silly sort of pizza boy outfit as my mother described it. Um, walking around as a games maker, uh, although technically I was a games maker. Um, I ended up being the sort of executive assistant to the vice chair of the International Paralympic Committee, who is the gentleman in silhouette uh, on his Samsung phone, which he was given as soon as he landed in the country by an Olympic sponsor, one of their international relations actors, not a state, a multinational corporation with a particular agenda, particular business drivers, and he was um, quite possibly one of the most brilliant gentlemen I've ever met. Didn't know before, came across him, had an absolutely brilliant uh, set of skills for the role he was in. He was a brilliant diplomat. He wasn't trained as a diplomat, he was trained as a journalist. He's an Australian uh, magnate would, would put him in, you know, make you think of Murdoch. He's not in that league. He's someone who ran a newspaper for a good deal of time within the state of um, Victoria. Um, made some money, yeah. Did that, the IPC job that he was doing was unpaid. He was well looked after in terms of expenses. You know, he wasn't buying a lot of things. I don't think he bought dinner or a drink the entire six weeks he was in London. Um, not because he wasn't generous, but because he didn't need to in the circumstances in which he operated. But those circumstances were ones in which his set of skills were absolutely achieved. Possibly the only other person who I've seen with the amount of awe when you walked in a room, was Bill Clinton. Um, and it wasn't overt, it wasn't brash look at me, but it was a really valuable set of so that routinely Lord Sebastian Coe 
Sorry to keep mentioning Tories. <laughs> he did win a couple of Olympic gold medals as well. Um, who was chair of LOCOG, technically my boss at that time. He, you know, look, Poe would go to Greg and say, is everything okay? I was like, that always struck me as odd. It's like, surely Greg should be going to you and saying, is everything okay, Seb? And actually, that demonstrated how much of a reference point he was. So Greg was really what we would call in diplomatic terms the dean of the diplomatic court. And by that's the longest serving, most senior person in the sort of diplomatic arrangements. So typically, when you're in a capital like London or Washington, Paris, whoever is the longest serving ambassador there is the dean of the diplomatic court. And Greg held this position within essentially international sport. And I was very lucky, entirely serendipitously, to spend my time working with him in 2012. And that put me in some really fascinating positions, like in the Royal Box, occasionally. Like, he would hand out gold medals, and they would just be there, and I'd touch them. And it was, you know, fascinating. Um, but it was a really important insight onto the individual as being an actor in sport diplomacy. So, the power of an individual, skilled, or indeed unskilled, it can work the other way. But Greg was a really good example, and I learned a great deal from him. The second thing is about, the second image is of flags. And there are four flags there that you may be able to see. They are the International Paralympic Committee, the United Nations flag, the LOPOG flag, and the Union Jack. Now in each of these, these are structural things, bits of governance that operate in our world. The IPC, an organisation set up 75 years ago in Stoke Mandeville um, to help uh, recovering soldiers after the Second World War, has a very particular mission to enable those with physical disabilities to participate in sport. The United Nations, the world's preeminent state-based organisation. And then you have the local flag, a time-bound project management company that ceased to exist on the 10th of September 2012. And you have Union Jack, which, as we know, is already a composite flag of Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, and England. So you have, again, this different range of actors, different things that are going on here, different bits of the equation that aren't all the same. And to add to this, in the foreground here, the lady you can just about see with the sort of blonde bouffant hair was the Governor General of Australia. So she was the Queen's, our head of state, appointed person to run Australia now, de facto, that's devolved to the Prime Minister of Australia. But legally, that person, as we were welcoming Australian athletes into the Olympic Village, Stratford, she is the head of their state. Now, however problematic that is, and for a number of Australians it's highly problematic, and I would share that problem if I were an Australian, which would be a curse. Um, it tells you that there's something here about the governance and the sovereignty and the diplomacy that's going on, whilst 200 Australian athletes are walking in and concentrating on winning races, doing whatever it is that they're doing. So these are really important parts of the equation that we often overlook. These are the things that are happening whilst other people are performing on a pitch, in a track, in a pool. Okay. So I am by profession an academic and I've been doing it a little while, but I'd like to put this sort of health warning up here. So it's, you should treat what I say with skepticism because my practice, my profession predicates it on lots of these definitions and sometimes they're useful, but not always. So treat with caution. So this is the quick little diplomacy slide. Diplomacy rests on three things, negotiation, communication, representation. They happen in every aspect of the life, at every level, not just in embassies, by ambassadors, with Pereira or Shea, okay? We negotiated, I don't know, I negotiated with a 10-year-old this morning, get dressed, eat your breakfast, put your kit on, be ready when someone comes to pick you up. That's a negotiation. I negotiated with the taxi driver to pick me up, Taught me, um, I may negotiate with the bar staff from point after. So these are you know things that we do all day, and we're communicating, we're representing something. We're representing it whether we like it or not, overtly, whether you've got a badge on your chest. There's also a sponsor, manufacturer, a nationality, a region. There's multiple identities we can represent. 
And these are the real core facets of diplomacy. So whether you call it diplomacy or not, and you know, I've had the title leader in diplomatic studies, so I was labelled as it. But these things are happening anywhere. And this was the sort of core of the book that um, Alison and I did in 2016 about global diplomacy. These processes are happening globally, regardless of whether you like them or not. This is what happened after 2012 to now, in short. 2018, Stuart and I, both independently, wrote a couple of books. And this was sort of the first charge, the capture of sport diplomacy. Stuart's is very good. I aspire to that in some senses. But we have two sort of definitions that come to that. So the establishment that Stuart, or the, the parameters that Stuart and I established by having these two often complementary, but you know, we don't agree on absolutely everything all the time. Um, but these are sort of the foundation and other people have said that that's a quote if you like. So what this tells us is that there's some work that's been done now. In 2012 there wasn't. There was no if you looked up sport diplomacy there was nothing. You couldn't find anything. There were two articles in all of the hundreds of thousands of academic journals that you know, sit on dusty shelves that no one ever reads. One was about Arthur Ashe and the work he did in, after winning the uh, Wimbledon in uh, apartheid South Africa, where he went, you know, as a black man and was subjected to apartheid uh, uh, restrictions. And one was about the Iran-USA 1994, 1998, sorry, uh, match, which was replayed uh, more recently, as you appreciate. Now, that was it. It's a barren landscape. Um, for Stuart and I, and now many others, to populate. This longer definition on my behalf, I'd like to sort of stress the opportunity that this gives to speaking or helping practitioners. Practitioners can get better. So when I'm working now with the Foreign Office, DCMS, athletes, football associations, whoever, these are, this is why they want to be, understand sport diplomacy. You know, the government, really white also, not again, not this particular government, are addressing sport diplomacy because other governments, South Australia has a sport diplomacy policy. Just having a policy isn't always a great idea. There are plenty of policies, I'm sure we would all agree that we could happily do away with. But what they do give you is a starting point. And that gives us a chance to have practice sport diplomacy. I'm much more of a fan politically of George Orwell and uh, from my erstwhile office in uh, Bloomsbury I used to be able to look out on Senate House and room 101 where nominally he worked um, in the Ministry of Information during the Second World War and in 1945 at the end of the war he wrote this article called The Sporting Spirit which is a great read. It's available, it's short, um, it's worthwhile, it's heartening. But essentially it lays out the dilemma of sport and diplomacy. Sport has winners. And diplomacy, you need to keep talking. You need to keep, even if you've won, you need to be able to talk to your defeated enemies. And if you lose, you need to be able to talk to your the victors. The temptation to do neither is quite high, you know, the last minute victory. But the key point here is that sport gives you those opportunities. Because one of the great functions of sport is there's a fixture next week, next year, whenever it is. And because of that, you have to have the continued conversation. You have to agree to have that fixture. You know that you will be back here in two weeks' time because Bradford have got another fixture. And in four weeks' time, et cetera, et cetera. And because of that, you can have those continued conversations. So what a long dead Frenchman called uh, Cardinal Michelin, who was the first foreign minister, the first prime minister really, uh, for his sovereign in uh, Versailles, called Negociation Continua. Apologies for the French accent. But it just means you continue to negotiate. That's why he sent out ambassadors for the first time, who weren't, you know, the king's cousin's brother's, you know, nephew because he needed someone who was reliable to be able to tell people what was going on. So that continual negotiation is what matters. It's really been recognised 
up until relatively recently. So organisations like UN and CRR, as late as 2018, well, we hadn't really thought about that. It's not to pick on them, but simply to say that they hadn't really thought about how they were going to do it. So these are the sort of three reasons why I think sport diplomacy is worth addressing. Sport has a great convening power. We're here now because of sport. It's dynamic. It provides us an opportunity to do things and talk about things, and we can have that common communicative moment. It has a great network of networks. We know people around the world via St Kitts and places like that because of sport. And it is a great diplomat. Now, this is my direct quote of uh, Lord Coe last, he was two years ago when he now is chair of the International Amateur Athletics Federation. And he said, fundamentally, I believe sport is the best diplomat we have. I'm, lo I'm tempted to agree with him. But there were some challenges. So I'm going to explain four dimensions of why this is important. And again, do just chip in if there's anything that's not clear. So governance, law and ethics. Somehow sport is often thought of as immune from the law, immune from its ethical implications, immune from the governance structures that would conduct life. The things that people have said in a football stadium that they wouldn't say face to face. The conduct that because it's sport, it's okay to get away with it. The restrictions that that therefore comes with. So I took this image on the right, on the um, changing room door in the 2019 Cricket World Cup, you know, players can't have their phones, you know, that's a restriction because of some information that could be challenging to the uh, sporting contest. Because one of the great things about sport, indeed one of its most important functions, is the uncertainty of outcome. Once we know the outcome, it's not sport, it's art. It can be beautiful, it can be interesting, but the uncertainty matters. Was that clear though? Sorry. So, like, oh, that wasn't clear. How did they get? They weren't allowed to use the phone. So yeah. So just back to that. The players had to donate their phone to their kit, uh, to their uh, coach or to the you know, entourage at the point at which they entered the stadium, and they didn't get them back to our office. So, because of the nature of cricket, you can sit there and send a message on the you know, pitch is playing a bit heavy today, you know. We know. Uh, yeah. So th this is this is a response to the sort of Steve War, Shane Will, you know, we told them what the weather was like in, is it Hyderabad? So it's, this is the level of governance you have to go to, to ensure nominally the level playing field. And this is one example. Could have had you know, the yeah. drugs protocols, anything that helps that and sort of contrast with the old Lance, you know, mm -hmm. The, the, this didn't apply to him because it didn't apply to anyone at the time. Everyone was doping. I was just better at it. Essentially, his defence over the last four or five years, like, is that what does that do to the integrity of sport? And another dimension of integrity I, that's increasingly important is about sustainability. How can sport be sustainable? FIFA this week announced the World Cup's going to be on three continents, it's 101 games. I mean, the fatigue and the damage to the players, at the very least, their well-being, challenges that they're going to face, but the sustainability of sport is something we can't ignore, we're not going to be able to ignore. Our children won't be able to exist in the same way that we have. Individuals, again, players do matter. These two quotes that I have here, separated by... 62 years. Boots instead of briefcases, but diplomat still was a line from uh, the 1950 World Cup when England went off unceremoniously to be beaten by the USA, amongst others. Um, and then the second one players for England must be footballers, gentlemen, and ambassadors too. They carry a grave burden on their shoulders, calling them on them to be both well behaved, well behaved both on and off the field. Was in response to the John Terry Rio Ferdinand and from Ferdinand uh, issue in 2012, head of the Euros, where Capello obviously felt differently. 
But I would also say that this is a really function of just and not just the app uh, diplomats. So I've been working with a number of individuals um, about how they can be better sports diplomats. So people who won Olympic gold medals, who you know often trot off to Lausanne and places like this, and how can they be better in those environments? What are the skills that diplomats have? How do they become better? And really, the fourth fourth dimension of sport diplomacy that I'd like to share is to quote another world grand gentleman. Sport has the power to change the world. I believe that. It's something that I've seen in action in many different guises. And it's something that I suspect, even if it's on the park, down the road, something life-changing is happening, whether we appreciate it as such or not. And that's a really important part of why it matters, because sport can talk to people in ways that other things can't. So this was manifest in the UNJ, UN General Assembly in 2015. And again, you may have come across these things called the Sustainable Development Goals, aiming for 2030. A set of aspirational goals on behalf of a multinational or international organisation, which we may or may not reach. But what is clear is that sport has a role in this. So at the very least, to my mind, sport diplomacy matters because of the partnership with the goals, the 17. But it's pretty difficult to play sport if, you know, the seeds, the land isn't fit for it. Pretty difficult if you're hungry, if you're uneducated. Pretty difficult for women and girls. So sport diplomacy has an important role in being able to address those matters within the frameworks we have. We might not be the ideal, but they are what we have. And this takes place in an organisation called MINIPS, which is the Ministers of it's French, I guess, so I won't bastardise it, but essentially sports ministers from around the world who are part of this organisation. It's part of UNESCO, part of the UN family. And this is in Baku uh, in June. So they meet. It's a government organisation, or uh, intergovernmental organisation. They probably have some nice canapes and they talk. The impact of it is not always great. But in 2016, they met in Kazan, interesting cast of places you may know where they go, and they came up with something called the Kazan Action Plan. And that tells you how you can change Nelson Mandela's words into things that matter to people on the ground. And they matter a lot more to people on the ground, not in countries like the United Kingdom, just to be clear. It is a development agenda. That's not to say that there aren't many things that can be developed in this green and pleasant land. This slide just shares a few of the organisations that are engaging in sports diplomacy. What's missing from them, simply because I'm out of space and I'm not that competent with PowerPoint, is grassroots organisations. So in this country, Youth Sport Trust uh, reaches out to a lot of um, youth sport organisations. Places like uh, the West Riding FA, need to be able to know about it. Individual. These are the kinds of things that having developing a sport diplomacy strategy. So the United Kingdom may have a sport diplomacy strategy in the early part of next year. Our friends in Europe um, already have one, <laughs> um, which we ste stepped away from. Uh, we were working on it up until um, certain things happened. And this is something that having a European sport diplomacy project, 26 members, is actually something that's going into Dubrovnik in a couple of weeks to talk to the next meeting of that organisation or collection of organisations. So this is manifesting itself in many different ways around the world. And we have the opportunity, whether on the park on a Sunday, in our locale, or with a football club like Bradford, to be thinking about the sport diplomacy dimensions. And again, coming back to some money, it, it's worth a lot of money. The United Kingdom is quite good at it. We do quite a lot of things that generate sporting income. $150 billion uh, market worldwide in 20, that was 2018. COVID will have hit back, but we have a lot to say about that. 
to wrap it up. Perhaps the best bit of sport diplomacy there is, the Tour de France. Low cost, high impact, to quote Stuart. Began 120 years ago, by setting out on a bicycle race to sell newspapers. That's what it was for. Designed to sell newspapers. Not designed to decide who was the best cyclist, designed to sell newspapers. And cars and bikes, to write in the long term. But what it's done since is become I mean, part of French culture, French history, given us a great deal of excitement, at least uh, to cycling fans, and provided a free, in the main, access to high level sport. I was stood this close to the champion as he sped past at high speed this year. And I've done that in the past, because I'm quite happy. But you don't get that close to many champion sports people that often. And when you're six and seven deep on the side of a road, that gives you something. That's a connection. When I stood on the uh, first stage in the Basque country, the people next to me had a Yorkshire flag because Yorkshire travels. This is the conceptual bit that I'm working on. Happy to take any questions on it. This is how I'm seeing sport diplomacy at the moment. This is all represented in this fashion. But let me start, as it were, as I finish, or finish as I started, talking about the networks, the network of networks. The, dot, the lines don't mean anything particularly, they're simply to represent that sport travels. I might put one in for some kids. But this is an example of how sport speaks to people wherever you are in the world. So to take away two things, or three things. One, I haven't talked a lot about the role of women in sports diplomacy. And that's a uh, conscious oversight on the one hand, because there isn't a lot to say, there isn't a lot of evidence, but it's definitely something that we need to address. Women diplomats have had a far greater rise to, I think it goes as far as equality, but respectability perhaps, in recent times. There are now more British ambassadors who are women than there are men, uh, male ambassadors. The key posts in the UK Foreign Service are women. Brussels, Washington, Paris, all female ambassadors. There's something here about my trip to the Basque country, about how this sign, was this graffiti, this typosi, was painted on a very prominent bit of the track or the, the route as it would flip around into, into Bilbao at the end of the first stage. It's written in English, not the native, not, not Spanish, not Basque, not French. So it was designed to be viewed by TV cameras as it came by. And it's a you know it's a cause of independence. The Basque country has a long history of it fight for its independence, often bloody. But it tells us something about how sport has been part of their journey. Every town, village, that the first stage of the tour went through had a cycling club on that first stage. A lot of cycling clubs, a lot of sporting clubs in a small place relative. And also I wanted to share that to sort of capture the end of this sort of next phase of sport of boat scene, and this is the sort of plug, if you like. Uh, I and a few colleagues are working on another book. And one of the key functions of that is not just to keep my paymasters happy, although hopefully it will, but because since 2018, there has been a huge increase in the number of people writing and working on sport diplomacy, particularly from non-Western, non-male, non-white, looking like me kind of colleagues. And that's really important. So we will be working with Lindsay Richard Thierry and Haresh on that. So there, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Anybody want to ask you a question? So the part of Yorkshire in the Tour de France comes to mind, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yorkshire on the national and international stage, that's a quite an, quite an interesting aspect. Because it has worked, hasn't it, to a certain extent, you think? 
Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I, I, I've spoken with John Dutton, who was mm -hmm. the head of the Grand Depart in 2014, and I travel on the bus down as it Stockwell Road every day, every day on my way to the university, and the signs that says, you know, this is from the Grand Depart. And it has, it, you know, the, the identity of Yorkshire, helped by, I think, some of the things in 2012 as well, has certainly been um, put Yorkshire on the map. You know, Yorkshire was on the medal table. I'm sure you recall um, at the time. And having spoken very recently, and forgive me the name drop with um, Alistair Brownlee about Yorkshire's sporting identities, this is something that, you know, the, the, Tracy Rabin, whatever you may think of her, I would be advising her that this is something she could be saying about you know, this, this area, this neighborhood, this identity that you could really put on cycling rugby league, football, there's a lot of things that you could be doing that are distinctly in Yorkshire. And cricket. Cricket, well, you know, I know, Harry Brooks going to save us today, so, um, amongst other Yorkshiremen, because of course, what's good for Yorkshire is good for England cricket. Um, so, these are, you know, the, the, there is definitely something there, a Yorkshire identity. So, you know, I've worked with the Welsh colleagues on a Welsh sports diplomacy club. And as a region, the Basque country in um, Croatia, you know, relatively small countries, often smaller than Yorkshire, that are having, they're using sport because they can. And you know, with Wales, Guy Thomas and the, the cycling is one of the key dynamics that they have to say that we're on the map. We're, we're, we're here. We can talk about Welsh sport. Yes, of course, you know, the long history of rugby in Wales, but relatively recent success on behalf of their football team. You know, not just a one a one man band. It's not just Gareth Bale played for Real Madrid. It was the whole sort of ecosystem that came with Welsh sporting success for a relative period. And again, just puts you on the map. Just puts you there. And, you know, next weekend there's a festival of Welsh um, sport down in Cardiff, and you know there's going to be a sport diplomacy panel that my colleague Gavin is going to be talking to. It was a student of mine probably 12 years ago now, when he was based in Australia, and now he's working in, you know, for this, in sport diplomacy. There wasn't a job that he could have done 10, 12 years ago. So, you know, from, from Melbourne to Newport, it's a title of his book. <laughs> I'm gonna, do sporting celebrities make good diplomats? No, short answer. Um, so there will be some. But good sportsmen, I, on at least another version of this, there's um, uh, a slide when it has the sporting diplomat, it has Eddie the Eagle Edwards on it. He was so bad at his sport that they changed the rules. You couldn't be that bad at the sport after him. But he was an ambassador. In the 1988 uh, closing uh, ceremony in Calgary, he was the only individual athlete that was named. The only, you know, now, he was a character. Um, you know, you may have seen the movie and whatever you sort of make of the individual, but he definitely represented, communicated and negotiated on behalf of himself, his sport, United Kingdom, in that period of time. Now, he made a sort of celebrity career afterwards as well, and good luck to him, but you don't have to be good. So the idea that just because you're, you know, a world champion, you've got you know, the diplomatic skills to succeed, it's not there. And you can see, you know, plenty of athletes have chosen not to be political. Michael Jordan famously said, Republicans buy sneakers too. Like, so I'm not gonna say anything about this. You know, even once his dad was killed. So these are, you know, ways of addressing, you know, the skills. And, and what I'm working on now um, with the BIA is enhancing the diplomatic skills of athletes so they could operate in a very explicit diplomatic way in an IOC athletes commission or something like that. But also because representation, communication, negotiation happen in everyday life. And if you've spent 15 years winning your race, those other skills may not be things you've done. Now, actually, I'd probably say you've surfaced some of them because you have to negotiate with your peers, your coaches, your environment. So you've probably done a bit of that. You have to communicate even if your communication is eyes down on the track, it's still something there. And you're representing something because you've typically been wearing a badge 
of something, whatever it is, whatever sport. And you have you only know your sponsors and suppliers and all those kinds of things. So there's a, there's there's not a direct correlation. There are very few good examples. There are some. I know George Weah is head of state, so diplomat in chief in Liberia. But then his son's America. As you you know, if you watch the World Cup, he's there. He's there as a head of state cheering on another team because his son was born in the United States. So it's an odd sort of uh, concoction there. The good and evil of sport. Um, well, I'd say in some senses it's always been there. You know, sport has always been corrupted. When you go back to the ancient Olympic Games, you know, the the reason the Olympic Games took place was as an alternative to war. Um, for all well said, also you know it's gun, uh, you know war minus the guns. So there's something about the purity of the competition and the uncertainty of outcome. And if you're doping, whether financially or chemically, then you're changing that uncertainty of outcome. And I think whether it's you know big bits of money here, or big bits of money which were Bramovich's money, or big bits of money which were Herbert Chapman's money uh, back in the day. Football has always been doped to an extent. Whether it's any more egregious now than it was in the past, I'm not sure. I think perhaps not. It's just more of it. It's got more zeros on the end of it. If, for example, in five years' time, we're talking about the best players in the world of all ages being in Saudi Arabia, and not being in the Champions League, for example, then that's a governance change. Then that would be different. I remain to be convinced that the Saudis have the staying power for it, really, and that they will continue to invest in what, um, you know, the next Ronaldo um, sort of piece. Not because they can't afford it, but because they're famously sort of flitting in our attention to things that aren't core to Saudi values. Now, the regime may change, and the regime may up its game, as it were, in terms of being more accommodating to other ways of thinking about the world, in which case, now, see, it's part of Saudi culture, then that might be changed. And I do think there is some hope for all of the things that I find particularly distasteful about Saudi Arabia. There is some hope there, in terms of women's uh, rights, particularly in access to sport, which I've seen I have been to Saudi Arabia, so I speak with a modicum of authority. But also I recognise that you know, we're not in a position to moralise too much about what goes in other people's countries, given what also goes on in this country. One last question. What would be the dream part of God if you could do the best diplomacy within the sports? What would it be? What would be the goal? Today, if I could... Uh, convene a football match that would stop the uh, crisis in Ukraine. That would. That's not going to happen. But um, yeah, we could do that today. That would be an interesting one. Um, that's been tried quite a lot, and there's a, there's a great degree of evidence of the amount of sport for development investment into Palestine and the West Bank, and it worked really well up until people are about 14, and then Israeli. Jewish kids and Palestinian Arab kids go their separate ways. They play very happily until they're 14, give or take. And then they get inculcated into two different systems. And then by the time they're 18, one of them's got a gun and one of them's studying a petrol one. Not always the way around, I think. Um, so yes. There is some, there are opportunities. Sport diplomacy is in the arts to everything. I see in 2018 in Pinchang, the opportunity that Thomas Bach's Olympic Diplomacy brought together, as one of the images I had up there, of North and South Korea coming together in a conjoined ice hockey team, some you know, wonderfully coordinated uh, cheerleading. There were opportunities there for reconciliation on a peninsula which is the most heavily militarised in the world. Now, it wasn't realised, it was usurped in my mind by the President of the United States at the time for his own agenda. But there was an opportunity there, and sport brought that opportunity to arise. If, if it, it wouldn't have happened, 
without the, the happening of these event games and power of things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If ever there are things, I'd like to talk about things like Ireland and the, the way that Irish cricket and Irish rugby is played as one, one all Ireland and the implications of that. Perhaps also the way that sport changes diplomacy as well, because it's not a one-way street, is it? Because it's, 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 it's a two-way thing and it, and it can be so unintended consequence. Anyway, thank you once again, Simon. Um, next one speaker is me. <laughs> I'm doing a talk on um, professional baseball in 1930s Yorkshire, which is a lot more interesting than it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, thanks so much again, Simon, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.